at 7.11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on July the 3rd, 2019, if you believe it. I'm going to be continuing with uh, the Mandan today. Uh, but, of course, I have some preliminary comments. They are inspired by a small series of mud flood related videos that I forced myself to watch this morning. The reason being is because any of you who are familiar with this theory know that it actually involves a pretty decent amount of intriguing information. Uh, I find it fascinating how some people um, will take photos and just use their critical thinking skills and analytical skills and, and point out things about uh, buildings, structures, at various places, at various times, that don't add up. You know, one of the best examples is the marvelously ornate structures that existed during various world fairs that since were torn down and crap buildings put up in, in their stead. Listen, I want to know this. If the if the U.S. government, I'm going to pick on the U.S. since uh, I'm an American. Since the U.S. government seems to be so interested in protecting what they, what they say oftentimes are world heritage sites, what about these magnanimous buildings, these structures? They don't need protecting. Well, I think they do, and I think the same reason that they say that they're protecting these huge areas of land is the same reason why they destroyed these beautiful buildings. Now, I don't agree with the theories of mud flutters. The reason is there's a number... There's a number of logical reasons why certain phenomena can happen. Uh, for instance, buildings becoming buried over time. There's many reasons why that can happen other than a mud flood. There is erosion. There is literally the wind moving dirt and topsoil. Um... There is, of course, the possibility of abandonment for so many years. And remember, all of these structures that, we're, that they're always looking at that have a certain amount of dirt up uh, on the building, those stone structures can sit almost indefinitely. And I believe they did. I believe there were many, many stone buildings sitting in what today we have remade into cities and sometimes just small towns that sat there for untold centuries. Because I believe that America, and more specifically North America, more than South America, was a great thriving civilization for a very long time and had many stone buildings that remained standing even after that civilization had been completely brought to nothing. I'm not going to say wiped out because I believe many of the inhabitants of that civilization were simply carried away into slavery, into other parts of the world, and finally wound up settling a very long time ago in Europe. Stone buildings <clears throat> can stand nearly indefinitely. Um, 
if the window frames don't rot out, the glass can stay indefinitely if something or someone doesn't come along and break it. And again, there's many ways that dirt can be moved around. Anyone who's been through any kind of dust storm, and I have, have witnessed that very thing happening in a very short, short amount of time. Within minutes, tons of topsoil, dust, and earth can be moved by heavy winds and dust devils. So there's many reasons why these things can happen, why phenomena that they point out can happen. Again, uh, and I don't even want to get into the whole fireplace thing, because I've used too many fireplaces and been too close to hot stones and bricks to know how efficient fireplaces are. I grew up in a house that had a fireplace in the center of the house. And we heated that house with that fireplace and chimney. However, I do appreciate the fact that they are asking questions. For instance, some of the main buildings in Salt Lake City were said to be built right around the same time that all the Mormons were said to be traveling from Nauvoo to Salt Lake City. And how in the world are they so... And these are primo, gorgeous buildings with some of the finest ornate stonework. Much less their architecture and their design and the kind of manpower and engineering <clears throat> and material acquisition that it would take to build these structures. You're looking at certain things that are impossibilities. It's just the theories that mud flutters come up with and they seem to want to stand on them as though they're the only possibility, which is not true. It, 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 the, one of the first things that got me really irritated at them was um, <clears throat> one of them had suggested that um, there must have been an extreme climate difference <clears throat> in Europe because of all the the castles and churches and structures that sat there that didn't have any heating system oh excuse me I had to take a drink of water got something caught in my throat there they say that you know they didn't have any heating system so that the climate must have been different when they were built, which, again, it's a theory, and they tend to ignore the many other theories possible. For instance, a lot of those older buildings, specifically cathedrals, many people would put them based on their design, even back to the fourth and fifth century AD so they're putting them very very old now they can't date stone they're dating by design and when they think certain historical events happened okay let's just say those structures are quite old again stone will last and on these stone structures Stone and brick will last. Um, mostly anything masonry, except for when we start talking about t different types of concretes. Certain types of concretes tend to have, um, they tend to have characteristics that make them erode over certain amounts of time, depending on the type of concrete mix that is. Okay. Um, there are different types of concrete mixes. And I believe that some of the older concrete mixes that they used that tend to look as if it was actually stone today, those are far better types of concretes than the type of concrete that we make today, modern concrete. Um, however, okay, stone will last. The thing is, wood and other types of materials like wood and organic materials 
such as that it doesn't so when you use those types of materials to trim and finish out the inside of stone structures in time if those structures are left abandoned uh, uninhabited or if inhabitants move in that don't have the skills and understanding to keep these things up and to maintain them those materials used to trim the inside and to create systems that help to insulate these structures in in many instances very well by the way if you create air chambers between the exterior wall and interior wall it's an excellent means of insulation those materials on the inside used to trim the, the structures they won't last they'll rot but the stone will remain and the structure will remain so there's many different reasons for things and I'm like I said I'm not even going to get into the fireplace theories I'm not going to get into the orphanage theories because that's just I'm sorry it's really easily debunkable and I'm not going to get into the 1800 reset theory because I just think it's frivolous I'm not saying it's not interesting and I'm not saying some of these aren't intelligent I just don't think they hold water uh, <clears throat> now here's something to consider because we are talking about white people in North America pre-Columbian okay now some people especially when I first started theorizing that all the events described in the Bible happened in North America there would be a lot of questions in the objections because it's one of those things that when you even suggest that the events described in the Bible didn't happen in Palestine people have a real knee-jerk reaction to that real visceral response they tend to and <clears throat> you know probably just like flat earth or a lot of other theories that are very difficult to cope with when you first hear it I remember how difficult it was to cope with when I first heard it very for some time you do get responses that are um, I think a defense mechanism and before people start throwing mud at the idea of all of the events in the Bible that are described in the Bible happening in North America you have to consider that first off the types of populations or I should just say the sizes of populations described are extraordinarily difficult if you want to try to get them in the Middle East the other thing is explaining where these great civilizations went whether it's in North America or the Middle East so we've got somebody seriously tampering with the historical narrative um, and it is truly hard to say how long that's been going on now a lot of people that just want to adopt <clears throat> the Fomenko thousand-year theory <clears throat> and I don't I don't know I don't know which one's right I I haven't adopted any theory I, I've I've just been far enough down the road to know that there is enough sufficient information to know that history has been terribly terribly tampered with in the common era or AD period by faction or factions with motives that e even I haven't necessarily pinned down and that's important the MO but remember if they can successfully tamper with history they can successfully tamper with geography and the sciences and all kinds of understandings and they have 
I do think we need to keep an open mind to pretty much everything, but also at the same time use our analytical skills. Uh, it's why every time I come out with a paper and presentation, and the last three have been mainly having to do with the Bible not occurring in the Middle East. Uh, I invite anyone to debunk my papers or presentations, and nobody has. I've heard uh, protests, and they're always weak, because they're just that. They're upset, angry protests by people who wish it were something else. So we're, we're going to basically, at this point, picking up past the phase of talking about explorers, the possibility of explorers uh, from Europe early on that maybe planted the Mandans. And I'm not saying that is impossible. What I'm trying to say is that there is a preconceived mindset that that's the way it had to be as opposed to whites still existing on the continent for some time after many of them had to leave for one reason or another, were expelled. Um, there's a lot of reasons that this can happen. And it's true that it wouldn't be that hard to sail into the Gulf and then up the Mississippi, up the Missouri, and you're, you're going to be going against the current in both directions, so you better be really determined. And then end up in North Dakota, where the Mandans were said to dwell. Uh, that is a, a possibility. Um, however, anybody who lives near a river that's navigable, um, I suppose it's easy to theorize that the way their ancestors got there was by going upriver upstream to get there. It's a possible way. But that doesn't mean that because they live by the river, that their ancestors got there by the river. You see what I mean? It's possible. But it's not, it's again, one of those theories that there's multiple explanations for. And you guys are all going to have to just take what information you get and make up your own mind about what is the most likely possibility. Now, if you remember, I was talking about politics and altruism a few videos back. And I mentioned Andrew Jackson and the... Uh, the idea that he was against the bank and that that was somehow an altruistic uh, action of his. Now, something that's interesting that I just read, because I've been slowly reading through Richard Kelly Hoskins' War Cycles, Peace Cycles. It's one of those, it, it becomes a very dry read. Because it is, it's a lot of numbers, figures, dates, and things like that. But just one paragraph with a footnote on page 175. The paragraph reads, War phases have their heroes. Napoleon Bonaparte, George Washington, Tom Jefferson, and Andrew Jackson in the first cycle ending in 1814. And there were a massive amount of wars over just a few year period in the early 1800s. Massive amount of wars. You wonder why there may, might be so many orphanages besides the fact that abortion wasn't allowed in Christian countries. You can thank a massive amount of wars in Europe and in North America in the early 1800s. Anyways, peace phases have few heroes, just good business, bad commodity prices, booming stock markets, high unemployment, and they end with crashes and misery. The only thing that could raise the blood pressure a bit during the 1815 through 1843 peace phase was the fuss between President Andrew Jackson and Biddle, 
of the Second Bank of the United States over who was to rule the country, not whether or not the system of interest was to rule. If Jackson won, the system existed under the direction of the politicians. If Biddle won, the system existed under the direction of the bankers. This was a battle of personalities only. It was agreed that the system was to remain whomever won. Now what's interesting is the footnote. In the footnote it says, Thomas Jefferson inherited the land and debts before the Revolutionary War. To pay the debts he sold land. The outbreak of war prevented payment. By war's end his continental money was worthless. Because of a law that he helped pass, he still owed the debts. By 1810, interest had caused many of the debts to double. The Sage of Monticello was overwhelmed in debt, and almost everything he possessed was foreclosed at his death. Now, there were men who visited and wrote about the Mandans and other cultures towards the West many years before the Lewis and Clark so-called Expedition of Discovery ever disembarked from the East. They were commissioned by a man who was past his ears in debt to the same kind of people who had been exploiting the land and white people and blacks and Indians and whomever they could exploit for centuries before this. They had been exploiting peoples in Europe for centuries before this. He was up to his ears in debt to these people. And this is the guy who sent out the Lewis and Clark expedition, who returned with fully one-third of their time not even recorded, and all kinds of oddities and anomalies about their travels. In country that others had already traveled, and had brought back in many cases very odd information about. There had been even small newspapers that had ran very, very interesting stories about types of civilizations and odd things, artifacts, um, stories told. Newspapers that, by the way, around this same time, the bankers, the same sort of people I'm talking about, had made all kinds of outrageous loans specifically to many, many newspapers across the country in order to bring them to a point where they could not pay back those loans and those very entities, these bankers, this tribe, would very easily take possession of their publications. This is happening around the same time that Thomas Jefferson, a president massively in debt, is sending out the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then just a few years later, Meriwether Lewis is, well, let's be honest, he's murdered. And there are all kinds of shady things about his murder. There are all kinds of crazy things going on in the Louisiana Territory and westward. And insane characters um, that seem to be flocking to this area around this time. Uh, and not long after this, very shortly after this, what do you have but you have the Mormons trying to take control of Missouri and then setting up shop in Nauvoo and then out to Salt Lake and a lot of odd things happen with them out in Salt Lake and wouldn't you know it, they actually get quite a heavy line on the gold business of California somehow or another. 
And then, like I told you, it was actually a, a Mormon, Mormon royalty, a tanner, who discovered those great caverns with all of those quote-unquote Egyptian mummies and artifacts in them. So something is rotten, and it's not in Denmark. It's in the United States. <clears throat> so I'm going to pick up here on page 60 of the Shrag book, The Suppressed History of the United States. He writes, in a letter dated January 22nd, 1804, to Meriwether Lewis, President Jefferson specifically requests the expedition to make contact with and verify rumors of the existence of a white blue-eyed tribe of natives that had come to be referred to as Welsh Indians because of the similarities between the language of the Mandans and the language of the Welsh. Jefferson specifically asks them to make contact. and He wants to know about them, but that's the biggest black hole in their journals. Must be a coincidence. The original source of these claims cannot be pinpointed with exact accuracy, but they had circulated enough that the issue became a matter of great importance to government officials. Documented accounts began in 1738 when Pierre Gaultier de Varenne, Seigneur de la Verendry. That is seriously a name. That's like eight words long. We're going to say his name is Verendry, took an expedition from his forts in present-day Manitoba to what is now North Dakota in search of this mysterious tribe. During this expedition near the banks of the Missouri River, D. Verendry found a stone cairn with a small stone tablet inscribed on both sides with unfamiliar characters. Jesuit scholars in Quebec later described the writing on the stone as Tatarian, a runic script similar to Norse runes. Professor Peter Kalm of the Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences interviewed Captain de Verendry about this discovery in Quebec. The tablet was reportedly shipped to France, stored with other archaeological artifacts in a church in Rouen, and buried under tons of rubble by a direct bomb hit during World War II. And may I comment on how uh, patternistic that is. During wars, what seems to be targeted first and foremost in many wars is repositories of either artifacts or written accounts of things that may be damaging to the status quo of, you know, made-up understanding about the world. I also want to comment on something that <clears throat> and that's interesting, that he found something that was identified to be Tartarian. But don't forget that many, many, many more items have been found just in the Midwest alone with various types of writings and inscriptions, so-called Hebrew, so-called Aramaic, so-called Phoenicians, and so on and so forth. Latin, Greek, I digress. Verendry located the Mandan village in what is now McLean County, North Dakota, between Minot and Bismarck. It was a large and well-fortified town with 130 houses laid out in streets. The fort's palisades and ramparts were not unlike European battlements, with a dry moat around the perimeter. More remarkable, Verendry noted many of the Mandan had light skin, fair hair, and European features. Verendry described their houses as large and spacious, very clean, with separate rooms. 
On August the 24th, 1784, the Pennsylvania Packet and Daily Advertiser reported that, quote, a new nation of white people, unquote, had been discovered about 2,000 miles to the west of the Appalachians, acquainted with the principles of the Christian religion, and extremely courteous and civilized. The rumor spread. And somewhere along the line, a possible connection of Welsh ancestry was suggested. <clears throat> I'm willing to bet this is one of the publications that the banks made exaggerated loans to in order to acquire. In 1796, Welsh explorer John Evans set out to search for the Mandan, hoping to find proof that their language contained Welsh words. Evans spent the winter of 1796 through 97 with the tribe of Mandan, but found no evidence of any Welsh influence. In July 1797, Evans wrote a letter to a Dr. Samuel Jones that said, quote, Thus having explored and charted the Missouri for 1,800 miles, and by my communications with the Indians this side of the Pacific Ocean, from 35 to 49 degrees of latitude, I am able to inform you that there is no such people as the Welsh Indians." Unquote. Evans' conclusion was directly contradicted by Lewis and Clark in 1804 and again in 1832 by George Catlin, a lawyer, frontiersman, and pictorial historian who spent several months living among the Mandan. It was through Catlin's accounts and art that it was proved beyond what many could doubt that the Mandan indeed were a race descending from European ancestry. Some speculate that Evans may not have reached an actual Mandan settlement, claiming that the evidence provided by Catlin is indisputable. Well, that's possible, or... What he said was he didn't find any Welsh. I didn't see up there that he said he didn't find any white. Welsh. He was looking for Welsh speakers because it was purported that they spoke a language near to Welsh, which it is rumored that Welsh, I don't know about today's Welsh, that it's very close to, and I hate using the word, Hebrew, um, I fooled around a little bit with Welsh words here and there to try to find the correspondence, but haven't seen it yet. Maybe I'm missing something. He continues, when the Corps of Discovery entered the world of the Mandan in October 1804, the tribal leaders were receptive to the goals of the expedition. Lewis and Clark found the Mandan people to be extremely hospitable, and the Corps of Discovery prepared to winter on the Missouri River, building a log fort made of cottonwood tree trunks. The men in the expedition cut the lumber from the riverbanks, building a triangular fort facing the river just downstream from the nearby Mandan and Hidatsa villages. They called it Fort Mandan. For the next five months, the fort was a be, and this is just where they hire, um, this is where they hire people uh, for the next uh, push of their expedition, including Sacagawea and her French husband. <clears throat> Let's see. Get a little further down the road here. Now, this is important. So it says, with their Hidatsa friends and neighbors, the Mandan lay at the center of a trade along the upper Missouri River, inhabiting what is now central North Dakota. At the time of Lewis and Clark's arrival, they lived in two villages, Matutonaha and Ruptahi. Matutona was located on the western bank of the Missouri, and Ruptahi was directly north on the river's eastern bank. The Corps of Discovery built Fort Mandan across the river from Matutona. In contrast, and again, since they haven't actually located the exact site and 
just to the north of where they built the fake fort so that tourists can can go look at it just to the north of that when you know the army corps of engineers put in a gigantic dam earthen dam and created um these huge slack water lake and wetland areas and of course you know the army corps of engineers would never bury underwater all kinds of evidence of white people in north america would they in contrast to the relation of the Corps with the aggressive Arikaras of the region, the Corps and the Mandan were friendly throughout the duration of the expedition's stay. The Mandan supplied the Americans with food throughout the winter at their newly constructed home, Fort Mandan, in exchange for a steady stream of trade goods. When, the fort, when food became scarce, members of the Corps accompanied the Mandan on a buffalo hunt. Sheheki, or Big White, and Black Cat, chief from the Matutonha and Ruhapti, those two villages, uh, met often with Lewis and Clark, and the Corps participated in many of the Mandan ceremonial rituals. Lewis and Clark hoped to establish peace between the Mandan and the nearby Arikaras. Good luck. In spite of arranging peace talks between the two tribes, conflict broke out again as winter approached. Wouldn't you know it. Of their experience living among the Mandan, William Clark wrote this in his journal. Quote, I set myself down with the Big White Man Chief, Mandan Chief Big White, or Sheheki, and made a number of inquiries into the tradition of this nation. He told me his nation first came out of the ground and saw buffalo and every kind of animal also, grapes, plums, and the letter C for some reason, and determined to go up and live upon earth, and great numbers got upon earth, men, women, and children. In his investigation regarding the origins of the mystery, mysterious Mandan, Clark was told of the former's belief in a future state after death, a belief that is also connected with the theory of their origin. The Mandan legend describes a whole nation that lived in one large village, underground, near a subterranean lake. A grapevine extended its roots down to their habitation and gave them a view of the light. Some of the more adventurous climbed up the vine and were delighted with the sight of the earth, which they found covered with buffalo and rich with every kind of fruit. They returned with the grapes they had gathered, and their countrymen were so pleased with the grapes' taste that the whole nation resolved to leave their dull residence for the charms of the upper region. Men, women, and children ascended by means of the vine, but when about half the nation had reached the surface of the earth, a corpulent woman who was clambering up the vine broke it with her weight, closing off from herself and the rest of the nation the light of the sun. When the Mandan died, they expected to return to the original seats of their forefathers, the good reaching the ancient village by means of the lake, which the burden of the sins of the wicked would not enable them to cross. It sounds like a hodgepodge of, I, well, I guess I would say either symbolism or very odd um, <laughs> tradition. I don't know that anybody would absolutely believe something like that. This is why I would say symbolism. Interesting about bringing back the grapes because that's something in particular that the Israelites brought back when they searched out the land uh, during the Exodus. So he goes on, this particular tradition can be interpreted to mean that the present nation at one time in the distant past lived in a large settlement underground 
that is beyond the land in the sea the sea being represented by the subterranean lake now this is actually the author Schrag theorizing on these things the description of a vine that was used for people to reach the land of the sun and gather fruits and so on indicates the free movement of people back and forth between the North American continent and this other place the Mandan referred to as the large village so again you can tell that Schrag is is deeply uh, entrenched in the idea that white folks just had to have come from Europe or another land they couldn't have just been in America um, during the 1860s major James W Lynn lived among the Dakotas and wrote a book about them before meeting a violent death at their hands <laughs> go figure Lynn supports the aforementioned explanation with the fact that the legend legends of the Iowa natives who were a branch of the Dakotas and relatives of the Mandan relate that at one point in antiquity all the different tribes were originally one and that they all lived together on an island or at least across a large body of water towards the east or the sunrise according to these legends they crossed this body of water in skin canoes but they did not know how long the crossing took or whether the water was salt or fresh these legends speak of huge skiffs in which their ancestors of long ago floated for weeks finally gaining dry land this account is certainly a reference to ships and long sea voyages the ceremonies further tell a story that the world was once a great tortoise born on the water and covered with earth and that one day in digging the soil a tribe of white men who had made holes in the earth to a great depth digging for badgers at length pierced the shell of a tortoise it sank and the water covering it drowned all the men with the exception of one who saved himself in a boat and when the earth re-emerged sent out a dove who returned with a branch of willow in its beak um, again mixing of biblical lore with I don't know either symbolic or just odd weird or childish I sorry to say it like that but you know <clears throat> the back of a turtle and digging down for badgers just saying 26 years after the departure of the Corps of Discovery George Catlin went in search of the Mandan locating them and living among them for eight years before setting off on his journey Catlin met with the then governor William Clark who told Catlin he would find the Mandan to be quote a strange people and half white unquote Catlin describes the tribe as possessing strange hair colors and strange eye colors such as blue and hazel he speculated at the time that the Mandan had descended from Celts and that their appearance and atypical customs were perhaps the result of generations of intermarrying and breeding with Welsh explorers and their descendants or they were fully white at one time and that they bred with the red Indians around them here and there because there were so few of them because they were constantly being killed by the various Red Indian tribes around them now that was me my commentary I continue later visitors noted that the language of the Mandan and the Welsh were so similar that the Mandan showed clear comprehension when spoken to in Welsh Catlin described Mandan women oh by the way it is also speculated concerning the um, how close the Welsh and so-called Hebrew languages are that it was said centuries ago that a Welshman could understand if spoken to or reading Hebrew uh, so you know take that with a grain of salt 
were they specifically talking about Hebrew or a dialect of Aramee or Aramaic? I don't know. He continues, Callan described men and women as possessing strikingly Northern European features and found the Mandan in general to be, quote, a very interesting and pleasing people in their personal appearance and manners, differing in many respects both in looks and customs from all the other tribes I have seen. The more time he spent with the Mandan, the more curious Catlin considered them to be. He discovered, for example, that the Mandan claimed to be descended from a white man who arrived in a giant canoe after a flood had destroyed the earth. Oral tradition tells that his vessel became perched on a mountain top and that a dove was sent out to seek land. It returned with a willow branch in its beak. Similarities to the biblical account of Noah are hard to deny. Something I'm going to point out that's interesting, and I've brought this up constantly concerning the flora and fauna um, translated within the pages of the Bible, and how it's very hard to determine that those translations and the current lexicon is trustworthy. Consider the fact that in the Bible, as according to the Masoretic Hebrew, lexicography and the English translations it says that the dove sent out came back with an olive branch and in two tribes traditions they both have said willow well didn't the Dakotas say willow it did I just scrolled back. Willow, again. Um, I would just like that to testify to how many proper nouns and specific objects. Uh, it is very difficult for anyone to prove that those things uh, in our current Bible translations are actually what they claim to be. Uh, <clears throat> the more time he spent with the Mandans, the more curious he considered them to be. Um, I just went through that. I'm sorry. The last sentence in that paragraph was similarities to the biblical account of Noah are hard to deny. Yeah, I would, I would say they're essentially impossible to deny. Now, it goes on that during the years that Catlin, that he lived with the Mandan, he traced their old village sites down the Missouri and to the mouth of the Ohio River. During these explorations he found remains of fortified towns, some enclosing, in quotes, a great many acres. There are many flood references in the Mandan legends and those of other tribes. <clears throat> Even more intriguing is that in the center of the religious ceremonies of the Mandan, we find they kept an image of an ark preserved from generation to generation and performed ceremonies that refer plainly to the destruction of the land and to the arrival of one who survived the flood and brought to this new land the news of the catastrophic destruction. Caitlin gives us a bird's eye view of this unique ceremony, which is no longer being danced. Yeah, because the people being called Mandan today are no longer Mandan. They were taken by their enemies, and they were bred out of existence, which is exactly what they're trying to do to whites today. He writes, In the center of the village is an open space or public square 150 feet in diameter and circular in form, which is used for all public games and festivals, shows and exhibitions. Now that sounds a lot like the so-called ball courts that are found still in existence in the West and Southwest. The lodges around this open space front in with their doors towards the center 
and in the middle of this stands an object of great religious veneration. On account of the importance it has in connection with the annual religious ceremonies, this object is in the form of a large hogshead, some eight or ten feet high, made of planks and hoops, containing within it some of their choicest mysteries or medicines. They call it the Big Canoe. On the day set apart for the commencement of the ceremonies, a solitary figure is seen approaching the village. During the deafening din and confusion within the pickets of the village, the figure discovered on the prairie continued to approach with a defined step, and in a right line towards the village. All eyes were upon him, and he at length made his appearance within the pickets, and proceeded towards the center of the village, where all the chiefs and braves stood ready to receive him, which they did with a cordial manner by shaking hands, recognizing him as an old acquaintance, and pronouncing his name, Nu Mok Muk A Na, the first or only man. I'm assuming their word for man was Na, this is me talking, and the name of the patriarch who survived the flood was Na, not Noah. The body of this strange personage, which was chiefly naked, was painted with white clay so as to resemble at a distance a white man. He enters the medicine lodge and goes through certain mysterious ceremonies. During the whole of this day, Nu Mokmuk Atna, the first or only man, traveled through the village, stopping in front of each man's lodge and crying until the owner of the lodge came out and asked who he was and what was the matter, to which he replied by narrating the sad catastrophe which had happened on the earth's surface by the overflowing of the waters, saying that, quote, he was the only person saved from the universal calamity, that he landed his big canoe on a high mountain in the west, where he now resides, that he has come to open the medicine lodge, which must needs receive a present of an edged tool from the owner of every wigwam, that it may be sacrificed to the water, for he says, if this is not done, there will be another flood, and no one will be saved, as it was with such tools that the big canoe was made. Having visited every lodge in the village during the day, and having received such a present from each as a hatchet, a knife, etc., which is undoubtedly always prepared ready for the occasion, he places them in the medicine lodge, and on the day of his ceremony, they are thrown into a deep place in the river, sacrifice to the spirit of the waters. <clears throat> There's two things of interest I'd like to point out about that telling of that ceremony. One is that they said they believe that his large canoe landed on the mountains to the west. <laughs> to the west, not to the east. That's interesting. I'm not saying that's accurate because we've heard a number of other oddities about their stories and traditions, which I mean like a grapevine from underneath the earth. All right. Now the second thing, no matter who this, these Mandan are, whether they were bred from people that came from Europe or whether they were people who were still a remnant of the people here, who had just happened to breed uh, Red Indian blood into their bloodlines, and so maybe they ended up an off-white. Well, here's the interesting thing, no matter what you might think the origins are. The fact is, the man that they use in their ceremony yearly, representing Noah, they specifically paint white, so at a distance you can tell that he is a white man. That's something to chew on. So, just to conclude this, a um, couple more paragraphs. In 1838, a steamboat belonging to the American Fur Company 
Now let's trace that back and see who owned the American Fur Company. Carried up the Missouri, the end of the Mandans. A deadly wave of smallpox broke out from the infected crew during a stop at one of the Mandan villages. The tribe didn't stand a chance. Those who weren't killed immediately by the disease decided to take their own lives. During the next two months, the Mandan were decimated to near extinction. Adding insult to injury, the survivors were made slaves by their bitter enemies, the Sioux and Arikara. Nearly 30 years later, all the tribes were swindled out of most of their land and set up on reservations. In 1870, the remaining North Dakota tribes were huddled together and thrown into a new reservation. Renamed the three affiliated tribes, the surviving Arikaras, Mandans, and Hidatsu were now mere shells of their former selves, less concerned with their ancient heritage and more interested in alcohol. The Condensed American Cyclopedia reported in 1877 that the Mandans, quote, are now with the Ricaris or Ericaras, and Gros Ventres, or Hidatsa, at Fort Berthold, North, or just Dakota at that time. They lived partly by agriculture. They are lighter in complexion than most tribes, but you can trust that most of their Caucasoid features had been bred out, and certainly since then. He goes on to say the last full-blooded Mandan passed away in 1973. Um, there is um, one of the other authors that I have that I just read recently. Traced back all of the blankets, because don't you love these stories that you always hear projected onto us white European descended people that it was actually us that gave smallpox infected blankets to Indians thus infecting them and wiping out large swaths of them actually the company that supplied those blankets was traced and found out and I'll let you folks just guess what particular race of people owned that company. And you can bet that it's the same people who owned, what is it, the American Fur Company. And I'm willing to believe that the story that it was some infected sailors is either bogus or it was no accident that they brought that infection to them. So, as I said, I, I, I really don't expect this series to go on too much longer. I just wanted to share some really interesting stuff from uh, this book with you. I don't know if I will make a video concerning um, the very odd death of, of Mary, Meriwether Lewis or not, but we're definitely going to go over Kennewick Man and the intrigue behind Kennewick Man. And we may hit a bit on Clovis points too. I'm I'm not guaranteeing that. Um, it this was more to just get into the spirit of um, how many factions have worked very vigorously to cover up the real history of the real inhabitants of North America. And that is precisely why I brought up some of the theories of mud flutters at the beginning of this, because 
I think one of the most valuable things that they often do is show that there is often a certain degree of utter impossibility to many of the claims made concerning the great expanse of infrastructure in this country, how fast they say it was built and set up. It just, it doesn't add up. Logistically, it can't. The amount of things built in the amount of time claimed is pretty insane. There already was a lot of infrastructure and structures here. Um, I would say bet on it. There are far too many instances of great projects that you have to ask yourself how the manpower and the financing continually existed for these things in way too brief a period of time. Um, and why more of the most brilliant structures and buildings and great towers were torn down as opposed to protected, like they say they're protecting all of these very suspicious sites in America. Um, you know, some of the most interesting archaeological sites that exist for study still to this day, because I don't think the government's been able to tear them down and cover them up, are in New Mexico and uh, also Nevada and Arizona. These are some of them. They're not all of them. I find it highly suspicious where they chose to supposedly test nuclear bombs, and I've got a serious problem with the theory of nuclear bombs and nuclear weapons existing in the splitting of the atom, and even the existence of the atom. However, this gave them a great excuse to clear out wide areas of land and destroy whatever was there. And I already brought up Area 51 in the past. It is the same people who have propagated the theory of aliens for about a century now. I think to cover up whatever it is in these places that they're really sitting on that they'd like us not to know about. Remember, it's them and their movies and their media that have propagated this idea about aliens and the lore of Area 51. And you know if they're propagating those sorts of ideas that it's got to be something entirely different. So I'll leave you with that until next time.